Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, things to come, if we can figure them out. I'm Alan Cozen, and I'm being joined by my three regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everyone. And Steve Marinucci, uh, as I always like to say, probably the world's last full-time Beatles reporter. Um, you can read his work in Billboard and Access.com. That's AXS.com. And um, he's still doing other kinds of reporting, too. It's not just Beatles. Um, it's all over the music world. Hello, Steve. Hello. Thank you, Alan. Hello, Alan. Uh, hello, everyone. And Al Sussman, the executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine and the author of the book Changing Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. Hello, Al. Hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. Okay. So um, do we have any news items to cover this week? I yeah, think... actually, I, there were, we were talking before we started about the about the uh, 1964 concert tape that didn't sell. Um, right, right. But that was, I wasn't, I mean, everybody kind of uh, suspected that wasn't going to sell, but that wasn't, wasn't what I was going to bring up. Um, I wrote yesterday about that Ringo Starr YouTube trailer that everybody had been posting as, and saying, wow, can't wait for this documentary. And, and there was very little evidence to support that there was anything more than a trailer. And I got confirmation yesterday that indeed it's not official and and it's being looked into by Ringo. So being looked into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, mm, they they don't know, they don't know who's behind it. So I mean it it was I mean it was strange because I it I saw some people who are usually pretty knowledgeable posting it and saying can't wait for this, can't wait for this and nobody bothered to look, you know, I mean everybody kind of assumed. I mean it's a slick little piece, I I have to say. Yeah. But they're not doing anything i mean ringo's not involved with it so what's it about actually well it's supposed to be it's called ringo star the life peace and love the life and times of ringo star and so it's it's supposed it sounds like it's supposed to be a, a, a biography of him yeah and and in fact the clips that they show are all old clips uh i think there's like uh, uh most of them are from a hard day's night so they just basically stole a couple of clips from A Hard Day's Night. And I, there's one other clip in there. I can't remember what it's from. And they threw a couple of comments on top of it. And they did this very slick editing job. But it has nothing to do – Ringo's not involved with it. So they're trying to find out who's behind it. And, and I mean there's no website for it. The website links to Ringo's. But, you know, giving the air that, it, <laughs> that it's not. That is very strange. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, especially if the, it is, as you say, a slick little piece. You, you know, but but then again, I mean, the weird thing is that it, none of us heard of any such thing being in the works, and we're relative. We ever have our, keep our ears close to the ground, you know? right? Right. Um, yeah. Know, no, I, I was. I was. Say, I mean, I felt like you did. I think everybody kind of got the impression, you know, when they heard about it, like, "Wow, where'd this come from?" You know, and un, unless. You know, it's somebody doing something, you know, on the side, unauthorized. Hmm. But none of that stuff is, I mean, most of the stuff that uh, Hard Day's Night is copyrighted. I mean, uh, you know, uh, so I don't know where this is coming from, if anything is happening at all. Yeah. But, well, you know the way electronic stores used to have Christmas in July? Mm-hmm. Maybe now we're having April Fool's in November. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's that's a good point. That's a very good that's a very good point. So, so when and, we- and, and, and I was also and in the uh, sixty four tape. I mean that uh, the issue there, as you and I discussed uh, uh, in email, is that uh, the tapes that have been previously marketed as being Forest Hills are have been Philadelphia. And in fact, I sent you a follow up note and maybe you can answer it now. Forest Hills has never, to my knowledge, and I kind of did some looking has never come out. No, right. No, um, there's some question about whether any such thing actually even exists, but, um, no, no, it's Mm. never been, 
never been bootlegged or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. The, the one that was called Whiskey Flats, that's Philadelphia, right? Right, right. And that's the one that they used. That's the one that they used to say it was Forest Hills. They did not. You're right, Alan. This time they did not. Even though the description said there were clips, there were no clips of it that mm-hmm. I could find uh, online. Yeah. But uh, and uh, and a and a writer whose name I will not mention, who usually knows about these things, you know, mentioned the Forest Hills tape and. Uh, and was you know really excited thinking that there was something about it and of course there is not uh, or at least it doesn't appear to be. So. Um, yeah, you know I, I I did answer your your question last night about whether it had been out and I sent a um, something that someone pointed out you know in the description that they give they talk about the Be- the the Beatles reaction as uh, one of the young female fans goes you know racing past the barrier or something and um and 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 that made me think that you know it's it could possibly be an edited concert you know using using material from different concerts because that thing about the beatles reaction as someone you know gets past the cops um is pretty much in the shea stadium concert i mean it's it could have happened more than once i suppose but um mm-hmm. they, sure. th- that sounds like what like that so i mean who knows who knows what this thing is i i you know yeah. basically any legitimate seller is going to allow clips that will allow people to identify it because they're expecting people to spend a lot of money and nobody is going to do it if they can't hear that it's not something they that's already out there and that this is misidentified you know mm-hmm. so it makes it more suspicious that they haven't allowed you to hear any of it exactly exactly yeah. so so well until six months from now when they try to auction it again i guess uh i guess that will be that <laughs> Yeah, I mean it. It was auctioned in. Well, actually, it was less than six months ago. It was in August. So what is that? Four months ago. Yeah. So we'll see if it shows up again. Yep. Okay. So we thought this week we would um, sort of commemorate the fifteenth anniversary of George Harrison's passing um, by looking back on his career and. Um, you know, just sort of uh, another thing that we're we're bouncing off. I mean, apart from the anniversary itself, was there is a in one of the um, one of those fascinating extras that comes with the eight days a week <laughs> Blu-ray. Um, someone does make make a, a, an interesting observation that you know, in any other band, George Harrison would have been the front man. You know, right? Um, Peter and, Asher said that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it just seemed like a, a good time to look back at, at, at his career in broad terms. We've looked at individual albums, but, um, you know, his, his career as a whole, uh, we haven't, I think, done in a while. So who wants to start? Ken? Gosh, there's a million things I'd like to talk about with George. Yeah. You know, especially he's, he's such a fascinating person and a fascinating uh, musician. An artist, um, I think of him as being one of the greatest songwriters of all time, and I say that for his full body of work. And as we all know, and it's been said a million times over, being in a band in which you've got John Lennon and Paul McCartney in there, you're going to be overshadowed. And in the course of those seven years that the Beatles were recording for EMI, George only got to uh, have about two dozen songs of his own mm-hmm. on Beatles records. And one of the you know great benefits of the Beatles breaking up was that you got to see George really flourish as an artist, which he did on his own. And um, you got so much more music out of George than you ever would have had had the Beatles stayed together and continued with the same kind of format of two songs per album from George. Yeah. But uh, just for all things must pass alone, which a lot of people look at as being one of the great triumphs. In mm-hmm. some cases, so, a lot of fans look at it as being the greatest of all the solo Beatle albums. Just for that alone, he deserves so much credit because all those songs were really wonderful. And mm-hmm. it just tells you, and I always remember, and I bring this up every now and then when people talk about the Beatle breakup, I like to bring up a quote that Yoko said, which 
makes more sense <laughs> when it comes to discussing why the Beatles broke up. And she said that there was way too much talent to keep contained in that band. Mm-hmm. And all you got to do is listen to All Things Must Pass, and there's proof right there. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's from someone that contributed less as a songwriter than John and Paul. So, uh, you know, that's just one aspect of it all. I mean, uh, his work as a slide guitarist. I think it's one thing to have a, a style of your own as a songwriter, which George does, but also as a slide guitarist, too. He has a sound that as soon as you hear it, you know that it's George. Right. And I think that <laughs> there are a lot of people who are influenced by his work as a slide guitarist, which you don't really hear people say too much. Every now and then I'll come across a song being played on the radio. And as a matter of fact, there's one song that I get to hear quite often because I'm in an environment where I hear a lot of country music. And uh, I think, Al, you're, you're into more current country, right? Uh, well, not really the current, current country. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm old school. But every now and then I'll hear a song where I'll say, wow, that's, that sounds like a, a very Harrison-esque sound and guitar solo. Oh, yeah. And um, Toby Keith uh, yes. had a song called A Little Too Late, which was mm-hmm. a hit about 10 years ago. You mm-hmm. listen to the guitar solo on that, and it sounds so much like something George would have come up with. And you can point to a lot of songs that are like that. And George just doesn't get nearly the credit. You know, he, he, everybody brings up, yeah, he was great in the Beatles, and he had a few big hits on his own. And uh, obviously, My Sweet Lord being huge, and the big comeback with Cloud Nine. But you don't hear enough about him as being a great guitar player and someone influential as a guitar player. Mm-hmm. So um, those are just two things out of many that I could bring up here. But I would like to bring up one thing, which is kind of important to me, because I like to read a lot of what's on the Internet and social media from articles, all kinds of uh, articles from uh, musician uh, magazines. And I do feel that over time, since George's death, there's been a growing respect for his solo catalog. It's just something that I've picked up from a lot of stuff that I've read. And it could be more so with George than with John or Paul or Ringo in the case of John and Paul because, you know, John and Paul get so much credit. (laughs) So a lot of people want to point to George and say, wow, you know, but look at what he gave us. Hmm. And I do feel a growing respect uh, that I've picked up. And not just All Things Must Pass as an album in Cloud Nine, but most of his solo catalog. Just the fact that he was very consistently strong with his music and putting out you know, really great songs. So that's just a few things that I would bring up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Al? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, just to kind of follow up on what Ken was just saying, that uh, that may be because of the fact that, you know, <laughs> obviously the McCartney catalog is, the post-Beatles catalog is so voluminous, it's almost hard to get, you know, get a, a grasp of the whole catalog. But George, because of the fact that especially since in the last, you know, 20 years of his life, he only recorded uh, actually two albums that were released, you know, during his lifetime uh, under his own name, not counting the, the two Traveling Wilburys albums and then plus the one posthumous album, album Brainwashed. So his his post Beatles catalog is not that big and so it's uh, after especially after this amount of time it's it's fairly easy to get a good perspective on it but uh actually and Ken mentioned again the you know the the small catalog of his Beatles songs and and yet despite the fact that it's that it's so small note for note it's it's right up there, you know, with almost the best. I mean, you know, a song like "Something" mm-hmm. can be can be spoken of in you know in the in the same terms with you know the greatest of of Paul McCartney's ballads, mm-hmm. you know, and, or John Lennon's ballads. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and as a matter of fact, uh, early on, I. You know, even though you like me too much and I need you, are not really considered to be kind of major songs in the in the Beatles canon. Uh, 
Uh, they were actually among my favorite songs on those uh, sort of early, mid-period Beatles albums. And he did, you know, he did very, he did work that was very unusual for, you know, for that time. I mean, a song like Don't Bother Me, especially mm-hmm. with the uh-huh. arrangement that was, uh, that, that George Martin gave it, has uh, an exotic sound to it mm-hmm. that really is very different from what was what else was on those very early Beatles albums, you know. Right. And then, of course, he began hitting his stride in you know in '65. In fact, he he probably George Harrison is probably even more so than John Lennon uh, responsible for kind of bringing folk rock to the Beatles. Uh, chiefly because of his uh, the influence that, uh, as he was then known, Jim McGuinn uh, had on um, had on George and and on the group, you know, and obviously a song like "If I Needed Someone" is you know about as folk rock as you can get, uh, as is in fact uh, "I Want to Tell You" on the Revolver album, and of course back then when we were when we were teenagers back there in the '60s, we didn't we didn't have the musical sophistication to be able to appreciate the Indian music tracks. Mm-hmm. But boy, you listen to "Within You, Without You," and maybe even especially the "Inner Light" now, mm-hmm. and they are just absolutely gorgeous. Oh yeah, yep, yeah, you know. And uh, so his so his Beatles work. You know, even though it's you know there's not that much of it, it still still stands as in yeah as major works as and major contributions to the you know as I call it the Rolls Royce of of pop music catalogs you know mm-hmm. and uh, and and plus also his his now I'm I'm not a musician but. Through the the Beatle years, his work as a guitarist you could you could see the progression from from him being you know a young guitarist very much influenced by Carl Perkins and Scotty Moore to developing his own style. Mm-hmm. And and while the slide guitar aspect of it really is really more from the solo years, mm-hmm. um, he certainly had developed uh, into a fine fine guitarist mm-hmm. uh, by uh, you know by the time the group uh, called it a day sort of. Uh, and and as a matter of fact, um, uh, Ken mentioned how. How underrated a slide guitarist George uh, George was, and uh, I remember. In fact, I saw a reference to it uh, this morning on social media that uh, that Eric Clapton, uh, during that uh, that brief tour of Japan in 1991, said that George was, uh, I think, possibly the best uh, the best slide guitarist he'd ever heard. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. That's sort of unusual given some of the slide guitarists he's worked with. I mean, yeah, Dwayne, right. Dwayne Allman, you know, just to name 10. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> really? Really? You know, it, it's, Can I ask one question? I'm sure. Sorry, mm-hmm. No, I was uh, going to say that, you know, it, 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 George's work on a, as a slide guitarist is very characterful. And as Ken says, you hear it, you know, for two seconds and you know exactly who it is and everything. But in mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, outgoing virtuosity, someone like Dwayne Allman was in kind of a different class in a way. I mean, they were doing different things, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, Ringo versus Ginger Baker. It's not the same kind <laughs> of drumming and it's not the same I, intention. But um, right. anyway... Ken, what were you going to say? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just struck by that one comment you made, Al, that George, perhaps uh-huh. more than John, was more responsible for bringing folk rock into the Beatles. What about Bob Dylan's influence on all of them? You know, I mean, John loved Dylan, and George loved Dylan, and in fact, you know, I think, I think probably they all did. Actually. Even though you know, even though John showed the the more overt Dylan influence quicker, you know, through songs like, uh, you know, I'm a Loser, I think actually, I think George probably 
absorbed more of Dylan's influence as time wore on, plus the fact that he developed a uh, uh, you know a personal friendship with Dylan mm. that Lennon really really never did. Yeah, you could certainly you can certainly uh, pick that up in George's solo music. Yeah, very oh, heavy yeah. Dylan influence in certain songs. Mm-hmm. Whenever I hear Pisces Fish, I think of uh, a song that could be Dylan influenced. So yeah, exactly, which is probably why uh, Bob signed on and was able to blend in so well with uh, with the Traveling Wilburys. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Hello. Hey, Steve. <laughs> hey, Alan. It's your turn, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> well, I had I had three things I was going to bring up. The first thing actually was the fact that George came to the U.S. before the Beatles did, and I think uh, he kind of led the way without really knowing. I mean, because they weren't you know they weren't famous at that point. But I mean, I thought that you know that's that's a major cool thing that he that he did that and he played with people over here and you know that that whole the whole DVD the Benton Illinois thing and stuff. I mean that's that's really um, that's really a lot of fun. And then um, the fact that he I think Ken mentioned the uh, Indian music thing. I mean, but the fact that he introduced the world to Ravi Shankar or, or, or made Ravi Shankar more well known, especially to rock fans. Um, every time I, you know, I think about that, I think about that, the set he played at Monterey, which is absolutely uh, amazing if you listen to it and having, and having been lucky enough to have seen them both. I mean, they. Uh, I did see Ravi Shankar and Alaraka together um, when I was in junior college, and it was it was a great show. Um, but the the thing that I was really going to bring up, and I and I'm kind of plugging myself um, to do it, is that I just finished and sent off a, an article to Billboard this afternoon, um, and I called it George Harrison's Greatest Bits. One of the things I did after he passed away um, was I put together CDs of. George's guest roles on various other people's uh, records, mm-hmm. and I and I did a list of my ten favorites, and I and I posted actually a couple of them today on on my Facebook page, but I'll just I'll mention those two and and just say you know you can look at the rest of them uh, on Billboard because uh, it should be up by this hopefully it'll be up by the time um, actually it should be up by tomorrow if things go well. But one is the uh, Dwayne Eddy theme for something really important, which yeah. um, if you if you guys have heard that, have you have you all heard that? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a great instrumental. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. I, I I think that is probably you know, combined with the other one I'm going to mention. Um, my one of my two absolute favorites. I mean, I really. I was listening to that again today. I just kept playing it over and over and over again. I just, I absolutely love that song. That song, and apparently the album is. I was looking to see if the album was still in print, and apparently it's not, hmm. which really is a shame. I mean, you can get it on Amazon, but it's not cheap, which is really too bad. That deserves to be reissued. I mean, McCartney is on that album, mm-hmm. that Dwayne and Dwayne Eddy album. A whole bunch of people are on it, but and it, and the other one is. Um, is uh, Punch Drunk, Punch Drunk by uh, Ruby Horse, which um, which is really uh, if you got you guys have all heard that one, I assume. And the story goes that uh, they asked George uh, to be on the track if he would play on the track, and he actually agreed. I mean, these guys are really nobody, and he asked, and and he he played on the track, and they're a great little group. I mean, I've heard their other. Uh, I've heard other songs by them, um, and they have actually a couple of albums, and they have kind of a George style to them. But uh, the you know I mean his if you look into his the songs that he did with other people, and if you if you have uh, Christopher Englehart's uh, Beatles Deeper Undercover, mm-hmm. it goes into a lot of those. He did some great work with other people, and you can hear his very unique uh style that uh, uh i mean he's he's done some great work so 
Well, matter of fact, Alan probably remembers this. Uh, There was, I guess, maybe, oh, geez, maybe like 20 years ago, there was a massive bootleg uh, collection that came out of all of his guest appearances called Spot the Looney. Right. Mm. Which was like, like, you know, five five discs worth Mm -hmm. of all of his guest appearances. Yeah, right. and it's and it's great stuff. I mean, Basketball Jones is on there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, most people don't uh, you know aren't aware that mm-hmm. uh, that that's George Harrison playing guitar, on, right? Mm-hmm. On on Cheech and Chong's Basketball Jones. <laughs> I ha- I have I have the the two the CDs that I put together, and I have four uh, four of them in my hand, and I I had started put, to put together a fifth and never. It never happened. I don't know why, but I mean, some of the tracks I have on here, um, uh, that kind of woman by Eric Clapton. Yeah. Try, try some, buy some, uh, obviously by Ronnie Spector. Cost to find town by splinter, which Mm -hmm. in looking up this afternoon, those are not on CD here. They're on CD in, in Korea. If you want to pay 20 bucks a a piece for them, which is really a shame. The splinter album, by the way, the place I love is a great album Mm -hmm. and it's got George, George's imprint all over it. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's playing he's got like three different roles on the album, which is crazy. Yeah. King of Broken Hearts is another song. Um, yeah. Ringo's King of Broken Hearts. Mm-hmm. He does. He plays on Alvin Lee's cover of I Want You, She's So Heavy. Mm-hmm. Which oh, yeah. Really, which is really kind of which is really kind of fun. Um, nice. There's the Rod and the Krishna Temple. There's, I mean, there's just so many, there's just so many that he, so many really good tracks that he is on. It's worth you know. pointing out because we we did our show last week on Apple, right? Apple Record Company, mm-hmm. and if you were to compare all four Beatles and their involvement with Apple, George did more than all of them. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, more than more than any of the Beatles. He he produced more. He played on more of their records. Not to give the other the Beatles, you know a lot less credit because they were all involved with the record company. But George, I mean, worked with Billy Preston and Jackie Lomax and Badfinger and Doris Troy. And, you know, there's so many artists on Apple that he helped, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, <laughs> especially Jackie Lomax. Mm-hmm. It's really, he put a lot of effort behind that particular album. So, yeah. yep. Mm-hmm. Very true, and the uh, and also since uh, Steve mentioned Ravi Shankar, the uh, uh, the soundtrack to Raga was on Apple mainly because of George. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not to mention right. the well, Ra- Ravi Shankar concert from in, from uh, uh, Festival of India from New York. Oh, it was, yeah. was right. another. Yeah, um, there was there was some t- there was some talk at some point. Um, about sort of George and Ringo running Apple because, you know, after the breakup even, because John and Paul were not particularly interested in, and they were both kind of keen on producing things. Do you remember that? Anyone else? Is it me? No. Hmm. Not no. really, no. I seem to remember reading something about that, that it was, was something he was interested in doing and it just didn't come together because there was so much infighting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it makes think, sense. Mm, well, fortunately, um, there is so much to say about George that um, all of the stuff I was thinking of, I don't think any of you did, or the stuff that you did, I still have stuff left over. You know. Oh, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. And in a certain way, George was a, a, a really kind of paradoxical guy, you know. I mean, on one hand, he could be extremely funny, you know. I mean... Things like, uh, you know, we, we think of the lines in Hard Day's Night, which were written for him, but they seem to suit him really well, you know, uh, like the the meeting that he has with the uh, advertising guy, you know, uh, it, I, you know, I'd be quite prepared for that eventuality and that kind of thing. And it, uh, those are dead grotty. We turn down the sound and say rude things. I mean, those, those seem right. like things that George actually would say, you know, mm-hmm. um, just just based on his humor elsewhere. And he also, on the other hand, had this kind of strangely bitter side, maybe not so strange. Mm-hmm. I mean, given that 
what he was bitter about was the, the you know what they went through during the touring years and um you know that the yeah. film sort of touched on but i don't think uh you know got really to the heart of it i mean the heart of it is in george's words you know we they gave us they they bought the records they gave us their money but we gave them our nervous systems you know right um so um then there is the 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 musical aspect as a player you know he was a, a lot of his things were just perfect for the songs they were in yet you mm. know now we know um you know thanks to the lewis and recording sessions book i guess exactly how and, and not to mention bootlegs that have early takes we know exactly how hard he worked on those things i mean some of those early takes even of something like I saw her standing there, which they'd been playing for quite a while by the time they got into the studio, mm. you know, he's kind of wandering around, not quite there. And it, it, it could just be that, you know, even though they played it for a while and he was probably fine with it live, maybe in the studio he wanted to to reach for something and in the early takes wasn't getting it. I mean, the, the finished solo was fine, you know. Um, we know also about, for instance, um, I'm Only Sleeping, where, you know, he painstakingly wrote out the notes of the solo as he wanted them to appear when the, you know, when the tape was recorded backwards and flipped over, you know, um, mm. it was like, there was nothing accidental about that. He was getting a, a sound that you couldn't get from a straightforward guitar performance, um, but he wanted the notes he wanted, and it, it it took some planning to do it. I think they spent a whole day on that. And yet, on the other hand, when it came to something, you know, really sizzling, like on his own tax man, Paul's playing it. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And Paul's playing the lead on uh, You're Gonna gonna Lose That Girl, very bluesy, which you would think would be right up George's alley. And you sort of wonder, in a way, how these, how did these things happen? You know, what was, what were the discussions that you know led to? Uh, okay, Paul, you play lead on on Tax Man. You know, I, I don't, don't know. Uh, and yet, conversely, you've got a track like Here, There, and Everywhere, mm -hmm. where he does these lovely little, yep. you know, one note, two or three note fills, which really helps to make it this gorgeously simple love song mm -hmm. yeah you know that's right um he could come up with you know very tasteful things that you don't really think of if you're th if you're thinking of lead guitar solos you know i mean there's all through the beatles catalog you hear them and when you look at them in concert you see him doing them you know they're just these little mm -hmm. fills and and little texture things um going on basically all over the place there's one that's a real favorite of mine and that's what he what he played in till there was you mm -hmm. yes that that guitar solo was very flamenco ish yeah. mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and you don't really hear that in the rest of the beatles catalog right yeah so it was just perfect for that song yeah I also wanted to, you know, when you were talking about Apple, of course, there are George's own Apple, early Apple. I was not counting uh, All Things Must Pass and, and the, the Apple conventional albums, but Wonderwall and Electronic Sound. I mean, Electronic Sound, you could probably take or leave. George could certainly take or leave it. it you know, he, he, I think, was a little embarrassed about it in some ways. You know, we talked about avant-garde and avant-garde a clue and, you know, which you attributed to Alvin <laughs> Lee. Um, but, and, and we know also from Bernie Krause, who helped right. him set up his synthesizer, that, you know, there's, there's, it could be questioned how much was George actually doing it and how much was Bernie Krause showing him what to do. Um, I suspect that George edited some of the tape, edited the tapes into something with a, a shape of some kind. Um, I, I, I kind of like that album, even though um, it's probably not something you listen to an awful lot. But I love Wonderwall. I mean, Me too. Wonderwall yeah. was just, when it came out, it was just great. And most of it was, you know, instrumental, and it was all kinds of instrumental. You had Indian stuff, you had, 
you had like cowboy music. You had, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you know, just straightforward rock. You you had, you know, it, and and just track after track, it just kept changing. And um, I used to listen to that thing over and over and over when it came out. You know, and that was something, you know, it's unlike anything any of them would have done. You know, it's com- mm-hmm. it's completely a George kind of project. And I and the, I guess it's the thing about George. He was sort of a little bit off to the side, you know. He wasn't writing just conventional pop tunes. I mean, he did a bunch of them for the Beatles, but as he was really coming into his own, then suddenly it was, you know, I want to tell you and love you too and within mm-hmm. you and without you and um, you know, these these things that he was just doing what interested him. And it was great stuff. And I think, as Al said, we didn't necessarily all appreciate it at the time. You know, we wanted mm-hmm. to hear, we wanted to hear, uh, you know, the straightforward rock tracks. Um, yeah. But those were, you know, those are those really have worn well over the years. And even, you know, George Martin has said so, too. I mean, even he, he kind of admits to not having been that into it at the time, but seeing it now is, is really kind of brilliant, uh, particularly within you, without you. So the fact that George could absorb all that yeah. at such a young age. Yeah. I mean, just to witness the arrangement between the Indian instruments and then all the string the string section, the Western influences, that must have been something fascinating. And the same thing with, with Wonderwall music too. I went, I would have loved to have seen George working with these Indian musicians. Mm-hmm. And I've always been curious because he's he's the composer on this music. Did he know exactly what he wanted, or he just have a, a rough idea, and the Indian musicians just improvised? Yeah, you know? it's hard to say. I mean, I, I kind of think it was probably more the latter. You know, I think he was, in certain ways, where some of the Indian stuff goes, I think he was more of a collector of sounds, and then an arranger of those sounds he collected. Um, because those guys knew what they were doing, I think, much more thoroughly than he did. He was sort of new to it. Mm-hmm. Um but um, yeah, you know what, whatever whatever his role was, I mean, you know, there's a whole school in 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 contemporary classical music of found music, you know, where you you and and also in in contemporary art of found found art, found objects, um, where you find something and you do something with it and you make it yours that way. And uh, mm. you know, I think there was a little bit more direct or authorial. Uh, intent in in his things than that, but um, you know, it's it, it will never really. I don't think get to the absolute bottom of of, of what he did with the Indian things, but um, mm. you know, the results the results uh, you know stand up. So and they also to us now are him, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm-hmm. I think those were my major points. Um, you know, I, I, again, the sense of humor coming through the Wilburys, coming through, you know, certain ways that that he would write a line. You know, that, that the Wilburys was a perfect group for. And the other things. One other thing is a certain sort of out there, you know, cheekiness that. Um, John had a lot of, you know, but, Mm -hmm. you know, John didn't write Sue Me, Sue You Blues or Not Guilty or I Me Mine or, you know, all of these comments Mm -hmm. about the Beatles pretty much while the Beatles are going on. I mean, Sue Me, Sue You Blues was a bit later, but, um, Mm -hmm. but, you know, Mm -hmm. Not Guilty, there's Not Guilty and I Me Mine. I was listening to I Me Mine yesterday and thinking, you know, it's, it's kind of clear what he's saying here. What are the others thinking about that? You know, I mean, John is waltzing with Yoko and, you know, during the, the film of him sort of playing it for the first time for everyone. But, you know, is anyone listening to the words and thinking, okay, you know, this is the, this is one of his grievances, you know, that it's sure that everyone is uh, just sort of out there for their their own ego, and and you know, and in a certain way he was too, but he wasn't he wasn't pushing it the way they were, and he was getting frustrated by that. There are those outtakes from Let It Be where he's talking to the others and he's saying how many songs he's got. 
that he's mm -hmm. he's got mm -hmm. enough for a couple of albums, which I guess became All Things Must Pass. And right. you, you look at the tracks of his that they at least ran through during Let It Be, and you've got, mm -hmm. you know, I think Hear Me, Lord, I think you've got All Things Must Pass, you've got... Mm -hmm. you Beware know, of Darkness. Yeah, right. you know, there's there's a whole lot of stuff, and, and wah -wah. he's bringing it, wah -wah, yeah, and he's bringing it in, and he's playing it, and uh, I guess they're sort of and shrugging, the, you know? Yeah, the attitude is, let's, let's Let's try get back again, mm -hmm. you know, or Maxwell, <laughs> or yeah, right. oh God, yes. <laughs> Alan, you were mentioning the the Let It Be outtakes. Um, you know, we've uh, the bootleggers have gotten a hold of some of his unreleased stuff too, uh, his solo stuff, and boy, some of that stuff is just so good, and it's really frustrating that the Harrison family have have held on to have had such a tight string on his unreleased output. It's too bad because yeah. it's not like, it's not like some of the, I mean, there are, you know, some of the uh, out, unreleased stuff that comes out, you know, you kind of get bored with, but some of the stuff that we've been lucky enough to hear is really beautiful. And it's mm -hmm. really too bad that they haven't thought, um, that it deserved to be released. It's really a shame. I, I think still so. might, might be released. They could they could be stretching this out for as long as they want to. Yeah, but I still well, remember. I still remember this the interview that he did with Timothy White mm -hmm. at the beginning of uh, 2001, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, right about the time that All Things Must Pass was being remastered and 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 reissued, and he talked about. The fact that he was that he was planning on on putting out this this multi record set that would have outtakes and live performances and all kinds of things and at least to this point in, in time it hasn't happened right yeah he mentioned the title portrait of a leg end yes mm -hmm. yeah yep. mm -hmm. right yeah and I have to wonder if brainwash was really part of that. Because Brainwashed is, is really a collection of a lot of songs through the years. It wasn't yeah. all just recent songs. Right. Just stuck Inside a Cloud uh, is supposed to date back around 1978 or so. Yeah. And so, um, you know, maybe that was part of what George envisioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very possibly. Very yeah. possibly. And uh, uh, again, going back to what, what Ken was saying about the, you know, kind of reappreciation for George's uh, for George's solo catalog. You know, a lot of people over the years have kind of poo pooed uh, albums like Extra Texture, for instance, and, uh, 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 and somewhere in England. Somewhere in well, yeah, <laughs> somewhere in England. I can think of someone that was. Yeah, I can think of someone who was uh, rather very close to this microphone, uh -huh. and uh, Gone Tropo, which we discussed a few weeks back, and uh, but especially uh, albums like Dark Horse and, uh, and and Extra Texture, which a lot of people have kind of sloughed off as well. He was being preachy, and it's dull, and it's boring, and. Then you you know you go back and listen to them again, and a song like "The Answers at the End" yeah is just a an absolutely gorgeous song, and obviously, uh, you know, resonates you know quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite you know, songs from his solo career. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, and of course, your I uh, if I'm remembering correctly, your all time <laughs> solo Beatles favorite album. Is well, it's my all time favorite album, period. <laughs> really, <laughs> yes, li living <laughs> in the material world. I do love that album to death, I really do. And in a way, well, another thing I wanted to say was that I think George Harrison, even more so than John or Paul, has touched me more with his lyrics because <laughs> I find George's stuff to be far more personal. I mean, let's face it, John's stuff was very personal, sometimes sure. a little too personal. Uh, but um, a lot of what John wrote about was about his feelings about Yoko. A lot, most of what George wrote about was his own personal feelings about the world and about himself, and it was more of a universal message with a lot of spirituality in there, and that's another thing George doesn't get enough credit for. Yes, it's great to bring up the Indian music, but along with that came 
a lot of people who started to listen to what George had to say and to explore spirituality and maybe look into Eastern philosophy, you know, because of George and because he brought that to the Beatles. Mm -hmm. But there's so much, you know, very personal stuff that George put into his music and, and especially on living in the material world. When I hear songs like uh, The Light That Has Lighted the World, which originally he wrote for Scylla Black, but you can easily imagine what he's saying in that song about his own life, you know, that he's not the same person that he once was. Don't just think of me as Beatle George. I've moved on, that kind of thing. You can easily get that interpretation from a song like that. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, you know, what's in his heart about himself, his feelings about the world. A lot of his songs, uh, part of the magic about uh, concerning a lot of George's stuff is that you can interpret some of the songs that he's written as not only being about God, but also being about a woman <laughs> at the same time. Sure. You know, like what is life is, is you know, a perfect example of that. Um, but yeah, when it comes to George, you know, there's, there's so many wonderful things to bring up about him. But uh, yeah, living in the material world, songs like The Light That Has Lighted the World Be Here Now is, is the within you, without you of his solo career. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it's like a mantra. It's very slow, very few words in it, but what he's saying is so extremely powerful to live in the present, to not just live in the past. So, and that is all to me is one of the greatest love songs ever written by anybody. And to me, it's on a par with something. And I think if that had been a single and had gotten some airplay, a lot of people would know it more and would <clears> recognize <throat> it as such. Hmm. You know, but George has George has written a lot of great ballads and love songs throughout his solo career. So yeah, I love something. Don't get me wrong, and there's a reason why there have been so many cover versions of that song because it's such a great love song. Uh, but you know, that is all. Your love is forever. Is an amazing song. Dark sweet lady. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's you know, there's so many of them throughout his solo career and uh, beautiful yeah. girl. Beautiful girl is great. Learning how to love you. Oh my God. Yeah. From three and a third, and listen to that beautiful acoustic guitar solo in the middle. It's gorgeous. You know, and these are all songs that are just undiscovered or, or not really well known gems from his catalog that deserve as much attention as something, as far as I'm concerned. Huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, Steve, when when George died, did you cover that for your paper? Well, for that's back Greenland? when I was working. That was when I was working for the Mercury, and yes, I did. We put out special sections, I believe, at the time, and and I did do some of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that was um, that was a very. I mean, I, the Lennon. I remember the Lennon uh, Lennon's death. I mean, that kind of blurred by. Because I was, you know, I was so busy writing at the time, and and that that was the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I did do something with Harrison. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about it at the moment, though. But I, I, I did. Why, why do you ask, Alan? Because I mean, I, I wrote his obit for the Times, and I remember it really pretty vividly. Actually, um, I, in fact, I remember somehow getting finding out that he that he had died at like 5 a.m. or something i'm not sure what i was even doing up but um yeah i don't i don't think know, i was it, doing any i i don't think i was doing any of that i don't think i did the main story i think uh they had me doing some some background i do remember i do remember they gave me they they told me to go out and buy books um about george and i spent a wad and they reimbursed me for the whole thing oh that's the deal <laughs> That's the, there's the deal. Yeah. yeah. So I, I remember, I remember that because I remember picking up the times book for one or the Rolling Stone book. That's what it was. The Rolling oh Stone. yeah, sure. Yeah. We're getting that, which had just come out at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. We yeah. had, um, you know, it, it's, I, everyone sort of knows probably that newspapers write obituaries of really famous people in advance. Right. I mean, this isn't right. this news. There's sometimes it, People seem sort of strange about that. But, you know, in George's case, um, when we heard he had cancer, we, I, I started getting it together. And also then he, of course, was stabbed, you know, and that, yeah, was, uh, right. mm -hmm. that was kind of dicey. So I'd had an opportunity to actually redo his obit two or three times uh, in, in his last few years. 
And um, strangely enough, I mean, I, I remember that the first thing that the Times did was put one of the old versions up online. <laughs> Oh, wow. uh, it was like, well, why? You know, I've changed it. It's different. It's better now. You know. Uh, actually, I was thinking in terms of actually of, of a Beatle fan, because if you remember, as early as July, there were you know there were indications that he was. I mean, that he was very ill and probably well, didn't I had, have. A I, lot I, of- yeah, no, I had written. I I did. Almost nightly updates on Abbey Road, you know, back yeah. when right, the website. Right, right. And, and, and I was in very close touch on that. And in fact, I heard later somebody told me that the Harrison family noticed what I had done. So, yeah. which was kind of interesting. But hmm. yeah. um, I, or I never heard from anybody. But I mean, yeah. and I look back at some of the stuff that I had done, and, and I really did keep a very close monitor on it i mean nobody there wasn't a lot of the you know there was no facebook back then so there wasn't all the you know flashing with the yeah with the uh instant <clears throat> links like there is now but so um but i found i had a lot of stuff back then and yeah. I, yeah, and i remember but I, getting, I, I remember getting a phone call from my friend joe caldwell hello joe if you're listening who called me at like three in the morning and said he told me he had passed away and I got up at three o'clock and I started writing and I never went to bed. Mm. <laughs> I, right. I stayed yeah. up. Yeah. I, but um, I, I remember talking at least via email with Bill King back in July and asking him, you know, since obviously in the case of, of John Lennon, you know, there was no chance to kind of prepare for how you were going to cover Mm-hmm. Uh, you know the the death of a beetle. You know, uh, it was asking Bill about you know how we were going to go about covering it, and uh, uh, you know uh, he was kind of saying at that point that well let's uh, let's you know let's hope for the best and and sort of play it by ear. And what had happened was that in the interim between then in you know in July and when and when George actually passed at the end of November, September 11th had happened. Right. And, oh, wow. Yeah. And so I think people's emotions were very, certainly in the New York area where I lived at the time, uh, people's emotions were very, you know, very close to the surface anyway. Yeah. And so I think. You know, they were uh, uh, that, you know, even though we had known that George had been was very ill and we were kind of prepared for his his death, you know, still that happening nearly on top of September 11th was uh, was really kind of hard to process. Yeah. Yeah. On an emotional level. I didn't know what to think at the time, because on the one hand, I knew that George wanted his privacy Mm -hmm. and at the same time i heard the quote that he said i'm not dying on you folks just yet Mm -hmm. so when i heard that quote it made me think well he's still got some time left i wasn't expecting it to happen when it did yeah yeah fortunately i don't live in the new york area anymore so i don't have to hear the commercials for that doctor uh uh, gil lederman who Wow. You know, who treated him at, um, you know, whatever hospital he was connected with at the time. And but also at the same time uh, was, you know, trying to get autographs from him, you know, get autographed guitars and things right. like that, mm-hmm. you know, you know, which was really, really inappropriate. Yeah. Disgusting. Mm-hmm. Really disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. So every time I would hear one of his infomercials or the commercials for, you know, whichever program he was associated with at that moment, because he he was uh, he had to switch a few times, you know, I, was I never not, heard any of those. Strangely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> On uh, AM AM radio, uh, you know, he uh, he probably still does infomercials. I on. I hear know, them. I hear them. Yeah. Now. Yeah. You know, um, it's funny that, uh, you know, when it actually happened, I mean, on on one hand, you know, part of my 
job was to sort of keep the obituary up to date and, you know, make mm. sure that it was going to, because it was obviously going to go on the front page, you know, and, and so that means also that it gets a lot more scrutiny from the editors too, because everybody sort of suddenly wants to participate and everyone has opinions. Mm -hmm. But um, it's interesting that, you know, once, once it happened, the rest of the paper sort of kicked into gear and for, you know, we're trying to figure out what to do for an arts and leisure piece the coming Sunday and uh, or maybe the Sunday after because I think it was late in the week. But um, they ended up going to the composer Philip Glass and it was just an interesting idea oh, because yeah. there's not too much in, they had in common except... Ravi Shankar at the time. Um, oh, Philip, yeah. Philip Glass studied with Ravi Shankar in about 1965. Um, and his music, you know, went in a completely different direction, obviously. But, um, mm -hmm. but you know, they, they had that in common. And I thought that was an interesting thing to do. There was also an editorial by, you know, one of the sort of editorial writers who I think lived up in a cabin in New England or something named Verlin Klinkenberg. And it, it just was interesting to me what people noticed. I, the thing I remember about Verlin Klinkenberg's um, piece was he was fascinated with the way George held the guitar, how high he held it. And, uh. you know, and it, it's, it, you know, just sort of interesting. People notice different things and, you know, and it's absolutely mm. true. He did hold it in a, in, in, in an interesting way, and I, but it, it didn't really occur to me. And on the other hand, I mean, I spent part of the day watching TV news to see what they were doing because um, I'd already filed my piece. I'd already persuaded them to put the update online instead of the old one. And, uh, and before I went into the office, I had sort of set up all of the uh, – VHS and beta machines to record as many channels as I could so that I could uh, document this. And, and when I watched it, I was just astonished. I think this was the first, first time I really noticed that there was already a generation gap between us and, you know, people who were yeah. just getting into those jobs now. Because, I mean, uh -huh. the, the thing that stuck in my mind was some news anchor saying and you know george harrison was very important in promoting bringing to light native american music mm -hmm. because it oh, obviously really? was yeah it was, it was obviously <laughs> you know she, she got the copy that said indian music and obviously that wasn't pc from her point of view and it yeah. hadn't occurred to her that there is in India, <laughs> and there are right. Indians, right. and they have music. Um, so I, I, it just was kind of astonishing. It, it also meant here was someone who had no idea what George Harrison did, you know, yeah. and and that to me was totally inconceivable because you know we we all grew up, and what the four of them were doing was basically the main thing you needed to keep tabs on. Sure. Right. <laughs> But yeah, oh well. And we all get that a lot now with a oh lot of my artists. Oh my god, no, yes. yeah, but young man, it's... people have no idea who they are. Right, right. But... I, you could tell that uh, a couple of weeks ago, when when well, when within what three days, Leonard Cohen and uh, Leon Russell uh, passed. Uh, you could tell that the news anchors on you know most local TV stations had no idea who these people were. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. Oh yeah. well. So can I uh, mention a couple a couple mm, more things? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when it comes to George, I think of someone who is actually not really known for being eclectic musically, but he really is. Oh yeah. And if you study, especially his solo career, uh, you'll pick up so many different musical genres. But if you spend, you know, the Beatles and the solo, you not only have rockers and ballads, but you've got uh, the spiritual stuff, the Indian music. You've got the rockabilly music that he loved mm -hmm. so much, the Paul yeah. Perkins. Country and Western, which you could tie in with rockabilly. When I hear a mm -hmm. song like Fish on the Sand, very country and Western to me. The oriental music that he did, which I love and nobody ever really talks about. Uh, a song like um, Breath Away from Heaven and, and Shanghai Surprise. Mm -hmm. I love what he did there. You know, exploring, uh, you know, oriental music there and using... Uh, you know, those instruments, that instrumentation in his music, you know, that was very different at the time for him. And I love the yeah. fact that he explored that. Going back to all the pre-rock 
Uh, he loved Hoagy Carmichael, covered a couple of his songs, sure. um, covered Cole Porter's True Love. Mm-hmm. And actually, if you go back to um, Shanghai Surprise, he did a song called Hottest Gong in Town, which All is right. uh, an original song of his, which harkens back to a 1930s type sound, yeah. you know, which, you know, everybody associates Paul with. But George was into that, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he could have done that. And also... The fact that he played the ukulele. I did an interview with Greg Hawks a few years ago. And Greg, for you know, most people probably know he was in the cars. And he played keyboards in the group. And he made an album that was all cover versions of Beatles songs on ukulele. Mm-hmm. And he brought up the fact, he said that there seems to be a lot of interest in the uke these days. There are uke conventions now. Sure. And um, he, he credits George Harrison. And to a lesser degree, Paul, because Paul was playing the ukulele on Ram on, you know, but Paul goes on stage and, and does the tribute to George by playing something on you. But the mm-hmm. fact that, you know, George embraced the ukulele the way that he did as helping to to, you know, ignite this interest in the ukulele these days. In fact, in Chicago, there's a uh, there's a a, a Harrison associated uh, ukulele group, which meets, I believe, every couple of weeks. And in fact, they've participated in uh, in the Chicago Fest for Beatles fans for a number of years. In fact, a couple of years there, they tried to uh, stage the, the world's largest ukulele jam. <laughs> right. Hmm. Yeah. And also, I mentioned a uh, previous show, the, the guy Jake Shimabukuro, Mm-hmm. who's a, a ukulele right. player. He became famous because he covered While My Guitar Gently Weeps on the U. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, it was recorded when he was in Central Park. And it was there was a video made. It was put on YouTube. And it helped to give him his career and a, and, uh, a recording career. So, um, you know, just this whole thing that a lot of people don't really give George credit for. And you talked mm-hmm. about his humor and the Traveling Wilburys. you got to mention Monty Python. Oh, oh, of course. How it helped Monty Python with the life of Brian. <laughs> you know. <laughs> George was oh, a, yeah. such a fascinating person because there was there were so many opposites in his character. Like you were saying, Alan. You know, there was a real dark, moody, serious side to him, and there was a very humorous, comical side to him. Mm-hmm. The same guy that loved gardening. He loved gardening and then he liked something dangerous like race car driving at the same time, <laughs> you know. It's the same guy. That loves both, you know, yeah. the yin and yang of everything. So, in fact, uh, in, in fact, speaking of his humor, there's a story that we really can't tell in full, but you can find on the uh, uh, the in the the John Scheinfeld film about Harry Nilsson, uh, who is Harry Nilsson and why is everybody talking about him? About um, <laughs> I think I know what you're going to say. Yeah, uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> at Harry's Harry's burial. In, in 1994, and um, George said, uh, it brought up a certain song. Uh, well, okay, I can tell you at least the, the, the main title of it. Uh, it's a song from Harry's uh, Son of Schmilson album called, called You're Breaking My Heart. Mm-hmm. Ah. But, but, uh, I can, I can it all the way. Right. So, um, if you go, see, if, you, if you have the DVD of the film, Take a look at it. You'll you'll know the full story. <laughs> but George kind of initiated this uh, this sing along at at Harry's graveside of that song. <laughs> yeah, and Harry would have loved it. <laughs> oh yeah, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> yes, he definitely would have. Okay, so that was our um, I guess let's say fifteenth anniversary um, tribute and reminiscence of uh, George Harrison. Um, and uh, we'll delve into his individual albums uh, in the year to come, no doubt. So um, thanks for listening. You can contact us at uh, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. Send us emails, send us letters, send us suggestions, uh, comments, questions. And sometimes we answer. Sometimes we'll, we're we're trying to save some up to answer on the show. If um, if you have any that you think uh, would be pertinent, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at at symbol things we said fab. Uh, 
We have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. And Ken, how do people get in touch with you? They can email me at everylittlething at att.net. And I just want to mention something that's going on on my website right now, kenmichaelsradio.com. I do have, as part of my Beatles trivia and games page, copies of Eight Days a Week on Blu-ray, the deluxe version, to give away. So I do have a trivia question or a game that gets posted every Monday, and you have a full week to answer. So if you just go to that page, then you could possibly win that amongst all these other great prizes. And I also have a special contest, which will start on December the 3rd. And Al, do you remember Lonnie Ostro? I I remember the name, yes. Okay, well, Lonnie is a guy that I've known since the early 90s. He used to be part of a Beatles radio program called Beyond the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, Mike Lynch, a friend of ours who's been a guest on this show, was also a co-host with Lonnie. Well, Lonnie's written a brand new book. He's actually a novelist now. Mm -hmm. And it's called Poet of the Wrong Generation. And it's all about this guy in the early 90s who's very young. He writes poetry, has never really written songs at all, hooks up with someone at his high school, and ends up getting a record contract. And he becomes a star practically overnight. And only he discovers that being a star is not what it's cracked up to be. And there's constant references to 60s artists throughout the book. And it's all about someone who really loved the great poets of our time. Lennon, McCartney, Dylan, uh, Paul Simon. They mentioned Harry uh, Chapin, you know, someone like that, Jim Croce. Mm. And he feels like he's in a world in the early 90s now where people can't relate. Young people can't relate to lyricists and poets who are putting out really strong material that actually have a message and say something. So he's trying to do that with his music. But there's lots of Beatle references in there. And I'm giving away copies of that book, which Lonnie will sign himself. Poet of the Wrong Generation. So if you can, visit my website. It's part of my special contest, along with my Beatles trivia page. Okay, Steve, how do people get in contact with you? People can email me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I have a Facebook page, which alternates between, a personal Facebook page, which alternates between music and politics. But my Beatles news group, Beatles News and Commentary, is just music, if that's your, that's only your thing. And uh, I post uh, uh, a link uh, to stories, and I, po- and I post, you know, various Beatles news things uh, there. So come by there and talk Beatles. Um, okay. Uh, Al? Uh very simple. Uh, Facebook, uh, Al Sussman. Uh, uh, Twitter, at ASUSS49 or through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. Okay, and you can reach me through Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. I may do Alan Cozen Mono in Stereo at some point. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but Remixed will do for now. Um, so, um, thanks again for listening and for Ken Michael, Steve Marinucci, and Al Sussman. This is Alan Cozen saying, see you next time. Mm-hmm.